1969, a woman by the name of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote a groundbreaking book on the subject of death and, and dying. She noted that there was a pattern of behavior that dying patients exhibited as they approached death from a, a terminal uh, disease or suffered the death of someone that they loved, for example. Her five stages of grieving have become famous and often repeated in teaching people how to cope with a serious illness uh, and death, or perhaps the, the loss of someone that they, that they love. In case you're not familiar with these, the five stages uh, in the grieving process she mentioned uh, are the following. First, shock or denial. In other words, uh, people are frozen in a daze uh, they can't believe that what's happened has actually happened. They, they can't process it. You know, people call this shock or, or denial. The second phase that she described was anger. People are mad at God or mad at themselves or they simply find that being angry is a good coping mechanism. If they stay angry, you know, people leave them alone. And so uh, that's the second stage that she described. The third stage, uh, interesting, she called bargaining. Bargaining, trying to put off the, the inevitable, uh, you know, uh, making a deal with God. I'll be good, God, I'll be good, I'll read my Bible every day if you, you let me you know, survive until my daughter's wedding. Or I'll make a deal with you. you know, some, some kind of bargaining uh, situation. If God does this, uh, you'll, do, you'll do that to put off the inevitable. The fourth stage, uh, depression. Uh, we shut down. All systems are not working anymore. Uh, we shut down emotionally in order to avoid the pain of reality. It's a way of keeping the pain uh, farther away uh, than uh, necessary. Uh, and so we shut down uh, emotionally. And then uh, there's the uh, fifth step she calls acceptance. In other words, people get to the point where they, they accept and they live with the new reality, whatever that new reality is. You know, I had this accident, I can't walk anymore, I'm a paraplegic, so it's a new reality. You know, and they finally accept that and they begin living uh, with the new reality. Or, uh, I was married, I had a wonderful spouse, and then that spouse has passed away, and I just have to get used to the idea that I don't have a spouse anymore and, uh, and move on. It's not a better life, it's, it's a different life, you know, and so that's uh, acceptance. Now, Kubler-Ross um, uh, taught that people didn't necessarily graduate from one step directly to another. And I've seen that myself, you know, on how people interpret her writings. You know, they say, well, there's shock and then anger and bargaining and depression and then acceptance, as if it's a, a stage, you know, you're, you're in stage one shock for a while, and then you go to stage two anger automatically and you stay there for a while, and then you go to the third stage, you know, it's like grade school, you know, you, you graduate eventually when you get to acceptance. But in reality, she described these uh, stages uh, more, as, uh, hmm, uh, more as a roulette wheel, if you wish. Uh, you start maybe in, in shock and then uh, go directly to acceptance and stay there for a while. And then you're out of acceptance and you get angry. And then you go from anger to de depression and you stay in depression for a long time. And then you go back to acceptance and then you get, you're out of it. It's like a roulette, you know, in gambling casinos, they have that roulette wheel that goes around and it goes round and round. It's got all little notches with numbers and they throw a little ball or a marble in there and, and it bounces around and it goes from one thing to another until it eventually stays in one slot and then whoever's got that number you know, uh, wins. Uh, well, she said that uh, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the, uh, the grieving process is very much like that. She says you, you bounce from one to another and hopefully you'll eventually land in acceptance and stay there. 
uh, but not always. Sometimes people bounce from one to another and then they, they, they're in anger and they stay in anger for a long time. That's their final go-to position. They never do get to acceptance. They stay in anger or they stay depressed. And at that point they need, uh, uh, well, they need counseling. They need help you know, to get to the, uh, final, uh, to the final stage. Well, um, this is um, a primary model uh, upon which uh, much of the study of people's reaction to death and dying are, are based. Uh, although she wrote this a long time ago, it, it's still the standard model that people use uh, when they uh, try to uh, deal with uh, a terrible event, especially a death in the, in, in the family. Now one thing to know about Kubler-Ross, <clears throat> she was not a Christian. And uh, in later years, she saw herself as a sort of a, a medium, uh, able to contact uh, you know, the spirit world. She would have seances and try to contact the spirit world for her clients and so on and so forth. So much of her later writings were not taken uh, very seriously for this reason. Now, I mentioned this about her because it confirms in my own mind the fact that she did not use the Bible as a model for her death and dying theory. And that's very important. If she would have done, if she would have used the Bible to develop her theory, she would have discovered a similar model to the one that she observed in people. However, she would have discovered a much more complete and satisfying response to death and dying. And that is the response of a believer to death and dying is different than what she wrote. Even though most people accept what she wrote as the final authority, it really isn't the final authority. The final authority is what the Bible says uh, about death and dying and how believers response to the death of a loved one. As a human being, a believer's response to his or her own terminal illness or the death of a loved one is the same as what she wrote uh, and the same as any other person's response. However, because of faith in God, because of trust in Christ, that response goes beyond the mere five steps that she described. And so this morning, I'd like to share those steps uh, with you uh, and take uh, the material from the book of Job uh, to uh, uh, support uh, the ideas that I'll share with you this morning. Now, if we had to examine one person in the Bible who experienced both the threat of terminal illness and the death of loved ones simultaneously, it would be Job. We're familiar with Job's story. Uh, he was a wealthy man. He was well respected in his community for his goodness, his wisdom, his piety. He had a large family of sons and daughters. And then God permitted Satan to test him in order to see if he would be faithful in trial as he had been in abundance. Let's see if uh, this uh, man will be as faithful to you when I test him with some trouble as he has been faithful to you while you have given him uh, abundance. And so Satan caused Job to lose first his wealth and then his children, all of them were killed at once. Think about that for a second. You lose a child, I mean, it's, uh, you know, don't even want to think about that. It's so unnatural. But he lost all of his children uh, on the same day. And then his reputation, and ultimately he lost his health. It seemed he was terminally ill. And then of course, he lost the love and the support of his wife, as well as his friends. Now, after all of these things had happened to Job, we read that he did not respond like ordinary people uh, usually respond. He did not act like the people that Kubler-Ross described in her book. He responded differently than most folks would in a similar situation. Most folks 
uh, if they had gone through what he went through, would first of all go into denial and shock, not wanting to accept the reality of the terrible things that have just taken place. I can't believe this has actually happened. That would be their first reaction. They would, they would try to put the events out of their minds as soon as, 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 soon as it was over. You know, it's amazing, I, I've done a lot of funerals in 45 years and I, I've noticed something very interesting that happens at funerals. Uh, the moment the, 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 the closing prayer of the funeral is done, one minute after, everybody who's attended the funeral is in a hurry to get back to normal. They start talking about sports. Those who smoke light up. Uh, they, uh, they, they talk about the weather. Uh, I mean, not even a minute passes after the final prayer at the graveside. Uh, people are in such a hurry to get back to normal. And so they stop talking about normal things while the deceased is right there beside them in, in the coffin being lowered into, into, into the ground. It seems that people want to get the grieving over with as soon as possible. And they think just because you know, there's been a prayer done and the, the deceased has been buried officially, I'm good, grieving must be over, might as well get back to normal. And many times people want to blame God or question God concerning their tragedy. Uh, as a minister, I can't tell you how many times people have asked me the question, why now? Why this? Why me? Why this way? You know, impossible to answer such, such questions. Believers, however, are not most people. Their way of dealing with death and dying is different because of the cross that is behind them, because of the spirit that is within them and because of the future that is before them. An example of this is Job's response to the loss of his wealth and his children, his position, all in the same day. In the book of Job chapter one, we see the five steps that this believer went through in his experience of death and dying which sets a divine pattern for grieving that all believers can follow when faced with great loss, including death. So what are the five steps? Well, first, mourning. Mourning is the first step. What does it say in Job chapter one, verse 20a? Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head. For that day and time, that was a sign of mourning. Job immediately begins to lament the loss of his children as well as the other good things that he enjoyed for so, for so long. Note that he accepts as true the events that have befallen him. He tears his robe, he shaves his head, he falls to the ground. These are natural human and a natural cultural response uh, during the time when he, when he lived. This is the natural, healthy way to deal with tragedy. Lamenting, mourning. You know, in some cultures, uh, the women and the men many times wear black clothing for a year. We think this is silly and old fashioned, but actually, it's a good way to separate oneself for a time of reconstruction emotionally and socially and spiritually. It says to other people who see us, don't mind me, I'm in, I'm in mourning. I, I remember my dad, he was one of five brothers. There were five, five brothers. And I remember when uh, someone in the family died, I remember my grandfather when he died, my, my father wore a, an armband. We were Italian, Mazzalongo was Italian, so he wore an armband, a black armband uh, on his left arm. And so did his brothers to show that they were mourning. And they had that black armband on their, on their arm, not just for the funeral, 
uh, to identify them as uh, you know, of the family of the, of the deceased. Uh, he wore the armband for months afterward. It was his way of saying, I'm in mourning. You know, go easy on me. Uh, I'm going through a difficult period. Everyone understood without a single word, they understood something had changed uh, in his life. The worst detriment to recovery from a tragedy is to force a time limit for ourselves to get over it, to get over the loss. If you don't weep, if you don't mourn when it happens, you'll weep or mourn later. I can tell you in my own experience, my dad died uh, you know, when I was 15, but I didn't mourn him till I was 30. Till I was 30, then I broke down and then I wept bitterly and I didn't even know why. And all of a sudden, uh, I shouted out to no one, I was by myself. You didn't even say goodbye. And I realized it's because, well, he died and he didn't say goodbye. I saw him alive that morning and that night he was dead. And for 15 years, I held that morning inside of him. It's not healthy. Many depressions and anxieties are the result of improper time and effort given over to mourning the loss of a loved one or the loss of a marriage, or the loss of our good health, or the loss of a certain family situation. You know who are the worst at mourning? The absolute worst? Boys. Boys are the absolute worst at mourning because they're told not to mourn. It's not a manly thing. I remember when my dad died, the, the ambulance came, you know, and they were in those days, you know, they put him on the stretch and they were taking him out and the policeman was there and I, I began to cry. And as I began to cry, this big hand went onto my shoulder. It was a policeman and he was doing his best. And he said to me, don't cry. You're the man now. You've got to take care of your mother. There's no time for crying. And so I, I took his advice. It wasn't good advice. Mourning was all Job could do at that point. And he did it as a way of saving his sanity. In the believer's response to death and dying, step two is worship. We read in Job's account, and he fell to the ground and worshiped and said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. As a believer, once Job could struggle to right himself from the shock, his first thought is to go to God in worship and prayer. Someone dies, someone you love dies and you see it you, 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 you realize this thing that people talk about all the time is real. Not a video game where you're going bang, 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 bang. Whoa, I killed 16 people. Yeah, that's for video games. In reality, just one person you love dies. That's a shock. You can't get over that. There's no reset for when that takes place. The only thing we can do is go to God and talk to him, acknowledge to him, God, you, you are sovereign, you are real, you're eternal. And I realize I'm only for a little while. Have mercy on me. It's unfortunate that so many see prayer as some kind of last hope or a grasping at straws when things go bad. Instead of worship and tragedy, many people turn instead to drink or drugs or, or excessive eating or abuse of themselves in various ways. 
all kinds of escapist methods to deal with the great pain associated with death and dying or personal loss of some kind. Who can help you with all of this? Only God. Of course, the verse here in Job does not contain all that he said. It doesn't repeat for us every prayer that he uttered. Rather, we're given the conclusion of his worship and his talking to God. We read about the insight that he first gains as a result of that prayer. He's mourned. He goes to God in prayer and he realizes, wow, I'm only here for a little time. God has given me everything and now God has taken it away and he's sovereign. He's gotten an insight that he wouldn't have any other way. That's the thing about death. If you allow it, God will teach you many things through it. Initial prayer and worship does not always produce such deep insights as Job had into the nature of our situation, such clarity about its meaning. However, when the thought of existing one more minute on this earth is too painful to bear, and I don't know if any of you have ever been to that place, where being alive one more minute is almost too much to bear. If you've ever been to that place, the only place that we can and should go is to God in humble worship and prayer. Uh, if trouble or pain and death don't drive us to our knees, my question is, what will? Many times, God uses tragedy as a means to draw us nearer to him than we ever have or could have been before. Our terminal illness, for example, or the death of a loved one is beyond our understanding. It's beyond our power. It is a supernatural thing at work in our lives. It's like being strapped into a roller coaster where we feel powerless to affect anything happening to us or to our feelings. For this reason, we need to come closer to the one who does have the power to control all things, including death. God may not answer our prayer to bring back our loved one or to resurrect our marriage or to give us back our health but he can give us more of himself. And nothing is better than more of him. This may not change the circumstances, but it does bring us peace and at times a certain understanding. Job, he did this and although his situation did not change, through his tears, he was rewarded with a crystal clear understanding of the true nature of his own life and its ultimate meaning and substance. And so you have mourning, you have prayer. Step number three, silence. Silence. In verse 22 it says, through all this Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. Although later on Job did break his silence, his first and correct impulse was to hold his peace and contemplate his situation and wait upon the Lord. The Bible explains this by saying that Job didn't complain to or blame God. He didn't charge God foolishly. He didn't question God as to the timing or the fairness or the degree of suffering. He didn't dwell on the why of it all with the suggestion that there may have been a better way or an easier way. He did not substitute a plan of his own for what had happened that might have lessened the blow. He said nothing concerning the events and how they took place. The Bible says that in doing this, he 
sinned not. Now, Kubler-Ross, uh, she described the stages of grieving, as I said, as denial and anger and bargaining and depression and acceptance. And we've come to see these as uh, normal human progressions and responses to death and dying. We should also note that for a weak and sinful person, these may be normal responses. However, to lash out at God in anger, to question his actions, to try and change his decisions or feel sorry for ourselves, all of these things are fleshly, worldly responses born out of our sinful and weak natures. The only spiritual reaction is the final stage, the one of acceptance. But compare these, however, with Job's initial response to death and dying. First, he mourned and lamented his loss. We see that within his very first reaction is included most of Kubler-Ross's normal human responses of denial and anger and depression. Next, he drew near to God in prayer and worship. He didn't bargain with God. He didn't accuse God. He bowed down before God in humility and trust. And then he remained silent. During this time, he contemplated his situation and he searched for meaning. What does this mean? Eventually, he developed a life-threatening illness, lost the support of his wife, and was condemned by his friends as a sinner who had brought all of this misery upon himself. Could you imagine if that's what your friends told you after something bad happened to you, that you know what, this is all your fault. You must have done something wrong. You must have done something to get God mad at you or something uh, because he wouldn't have done this uh, if you wouldn't have sinned. Boy, how comforting that is. These additional burdens led Job to the last two steps in the believer's journey through the experience of grief and dying. Step number four, enlightenment. For nearly 40 chapters in an ongoing dialogue with his friends, we watch Job as he comes to grip with not simply the reality and the meaning of his suffering, but the truth that stands behind not only his suffering, but the suffering of all men. Job learns that his experience is worth it if it reveals more perfectly the God that he believes in. In other words, if your suffering serves to give you just a glimpse of God Almighty, then it is a small matter and any complaining is foolish and sinful in comparison to what has been discovered, what has been given to you. Enlightenment, especially the enlightenment that enables us to see God more clearly is of more value than what we have lost, whatever that is, no matter how much we suffer. Job learned that life as well as death is in God's hands and the painful experience of it is justified if it leads us face to face with God. Even if it's just for a moment, that one moment is worth all the suffering. That's the key. You see, non-believers, their best hope is to arrive at that point where they accept a new reality and they learn to cope with it. That's the best. It doesn't get better than that for the non-believer. That reality, being that people suffer and die, and there's nothing they can do about it except carry on as best they can. As I said, this is as good as it gets for the non-believer, acceptance. Suffering and death for believers, however, brings them face to face with the ultimate reality, and that is that there is a living God who gives life and controls death by his power. The ultimate end, therefore, is that death and dying strengthens faith and hope 
and loosens its grip of fear and sorrow on our hearts. If I know that God is truly in control of my life and my death, I'm going to stop worrying about it because I can't change it. Because somebody better than me, stronger than me, wiser than me, purer than me, is taking care of me, whether I live or die. Only an enlightened person like Paul, the apostle, for example, could write these words when facing death. He said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. What was he gaining? Did you ever wonder what the gain was? He gains a face-to-face -face existence with Christ. So for him, to stay was to serve Christ. To leave was to be with Christ. Only a person who knows God can say such a thing. He had seen beyond the suffering and death and had a glimpse of God's reality and it was worth all the suffering that he experienced. And then finally, step number five, restoration. In Job uh, 42, 10 to 17, we won't read it, but the last chapter we learn that God heals Job and restores his family and his wealth and his position. This didn't change the fact that Job had suffered, had lost children, had lost prestige. Uh, his suffering was real. But you see, God doesn't give us our old life back. He gives us a new life. Here on earth, it's a life that we can live and live with. Sometimes it's very different. Sometimes it's harder, but the believers but excuse me, for believers, it's always a life where God is more prominent than before. You see, God is the reward for perseverance. You may not have a parent or a child or a spouse or a loved one or health anymore, but you now have more of God to make up for it. That's the key. And in the next world, the great promise for those who have experienced the enlightenment of suffering is that you will have all of him all the time. Because after your death, you will leave behind everything that comes between you and him now. Your body of sin, your need to survive, your many sorrows, your earthly treasures, these things will be gone. All of these will fall away as you are restored to the perfect relationship with God through Christ that you were originally designed to enjoy. So, Kubler-Ross explained how unbelievers faced death because that's all she could see as an unbeliever. And I'm not criticizing her. She did a good work for you know, what she knew, what she could see. However, Job describes how a believer responds to the death and dying around him and in him. He mourns the loss. He draws closer to God. He refrains from sin. And note that in doing these things, God will then lead the believer into the final stages of the experience of death and dying, which is enlightenment a fuller knowledge of God himself, and then finally restoration, which is a deeper walk with God. It is within this cycle that we experience God's plan and purpose for our lives when things go terribly wrong. You see, as long as everything's going all right, we're doing it our way. Sometimes God has to rattle our cage or bring some thunder and lightning into our lives so that we can begin doing it His way. All of us will experience tragedy in our lives, one way or another, and all of us will ultimately face our own demise. 
The only difference is that some will experience them as believers and some will face these things as non-believers. We have no control over death and dying, but we do decide how we will face these things. Will we face them as believers or non-believers? As always, you have an opportunity to be counted as a believer today. And you can do that by confessing your faith in Jesus Christ, leaving your sinful lives behind and being baptized for forgiveness, or if you've been unfaithful as a Christian, being restored through the prayers of the church. If you need to prepare for your own death and dying by becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ, I encourage you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.